Omaha's news leader, chronicling the stories and people making a difference in our community. This is KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. Thanks for joining us for another commitment edition of KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. I'm Rob McCartney. This morning, we're taking a closer look at the race for Congress in Nebraska's first district. State Senator Patty Panzing Brooks and Jazari Kual Zakaria are on the ballot for the Democratic primary. Curtis Huffman, Therina Yuki Connolly, John Glenn Weaver, State Senator Mike Flood, and Jeff Fortenberry are all on the Republican ballot. Now, Fortenberry was in office for nearly 17 years. He resigned at the end of March after being convicted on three federal felonies. Fortenberry was found guilty of lying to the FBI about an illegal campaign donation in 2016. The California judge will sentence him June 28th. It's the same day Governor Pete Ricketts set for the special election to fill the now vacant seat. State Senators Mike Flood and Patty Panzing Brooks are on the ballot for that special election. The winner will serve until January of 2023. The winner of the general election in November will get the job after January. But again, Fortenberry will still appear on the ballot for the first district race in the May primary. Now, we did reach out to his campaign for this chronicle, but did not hear back from him. He has unofficially resigned from the race. Now, Republican State Senator Mike Flood first represented Madison County in the unicameral in 2005, was elected Speaker of the Legislature in 07. He was reelected in 2008, and after leaving politics for a while, starting a media company, he returned to the legislature in 2020. Mike Flood joins us now. Good morning. Thanks for being here today. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Good morning. You bet. Uh, if Jeff Fortenberry had not been indicted, would you have still run? No. Why not? Well, I've supported Jeff Fortenberry uh, for, for years. I've hosted fundraisers for him. I believe, you know, he's conservative and, and he's done a good job for the first congressional district. Uh, when he was indicted, uh, I started to wonder what's the plan in the event that he's unsuccessful in the California courtroom. And uh, the longer it went on, the more I felt that uh, Republicans needed an option and uh, somebody that was really ready and willing to serve. And that's when I decided to put my name in the ring. What are your priorities if you're elected? Well, uh, inflation, obviously. Mm -hmm. and Nebraskans are feeling that at the grocery store and at the gas pump. There's just been trillions of dollars in federal spending that have contributed to that. And so fiscal restraint and responsibility and securing the border. Uh, there's a lot of methamphetamines trucking themselves into the state of Nebraska every day, and they're coming from Mexico. We need to secure the border, not just to stop the drugs, but also to deal with the uh, large number of illegal immigrants on our borders. What are your thoughts on Russia's invasion of Ukraine? What should, what should the U.S.'s play be in this? Well, Vladimir Putin is a killer, and uh, it's jarring. You know, I have a 15-year-old boy, and I was driving him back from a wrestling practice, and all of this was breaking and unfolding, and I thought to myself, it feels really scary, like we're on the brink of something that's much bigger in the world and a conflict. And I thought about my young man there uh, being called into action and, and being part of that. And so uh, the first thing we have to do, and, and I think it's critical, is maintain wonderful relations with our allies and the, and the NATO countries in the event that alliance crossed. And the second is, if we set uh, a boundary, we have to be willing to live by it. Um, you know. Is it chemical weapons, the genocide? Like, what are the, what are the facts telling us? But ultimately, I don't think constitutionally that's the president's call at this point. It is a matter for the Congress to decide. Exactly, and you, would, you may have to be act, to call for an act of war. What's your parameter for it? I can't imagine a bigger decision than uh, declaring war as a member of Congress. To me, I would be uh, really listening to the military leaders that are advising uh, lawmakers in Washington. I'd be listening to the people of the first congressional district. As someone who has a 15-year-old and a 12-year-old, it's very personal and it's a major decision and it would not be taken lightly. A Republican Party seems to have two factions right now. You have the moderates and the very conservatives. Which one are you? I'm conservative. Um, one of the great things I think voters should know about me is in the Republican Party, you know, I've, I've been able to unite both Governor Pete Ricketts and Governor Dave Heinem. Both of them are supporting me in my bid. Um, I'm also practical. Like, I've been the Speaker of the Legislature for six years. I know how to get things done. And you do that by listening to people and learning. And the more learning you do, the better off you are. You know, most, if, if not all, the candidates I've interviewed, and I've interviewed a, a couple of them, have said that they want to work across the aisle, reach across the uh, aisle in a sense of bipartisanship. Does that represent you? I have that record. You know, in 2011, uh, we passed the nation's first ban on abortion at 20 weeks. 
and it started right here in Nebraska, and it's now the, the exact kind of bill in Mississippi that the U.S. Supreme Court is going to rule on. And I got 44 votes out of 49 votes in the Nebraska legislature, and I believe that that's because my message uh, was one that I could earn a lot of Democrat support, and you know, it's in the advocacy. It's in the how. It's how you convince your colleagues, and that's a skill that not a lot of people understand. Well, along those lines, your campaign material says, and I'll taking it from your web page, I'm running, from co running for Congress to win this campaign and take the fight to the radical socialists in Congress. Is that working across the aisle? Well, I'll tell you what, there's one party power right now. Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi are united and, and they are working to make a lot of big government giveaways happen, big tech, all sorts of issues. People that I talk to in the first congressional district, they want a check on the White House. They want a check on uh, in Congress. And right now they don't have it in the House of Representatives. And, uh, you know, quite frankly, firing Nancy Pelosi is one of the top missions. How would you rate the pandemic, how the U.S. responded to it? What, what would you have done differently? Well, I would tell you this, vaccine mandates uh, from, the, from the top down as a business owner, some of us made a payroll since I was 24 years old. That was absolutely the wrong thing to do. I'm having trouble hiring people in my own business. And then when Washington comes out and says, I've got to make sure these folks are getting vaccinated, I'm looking at losing maybe 20 to 30 percent. So, you know, I believe in local action. I, uh, the government closest to the people is the best. Uh, as a member of the state legislature, I think Nebraska weathered it really well. In fact, we were just rated number one by Politico in, in terms of how we weathered uh, the coronavirus effort. And uh, uh, I, I think that uh, less federal mandates and you know, more federal support uh, of the states. You know, on your website, you also say, more so than at any other point in our lifetimes, we face a choice between prosperity and socialism, traditional values or liberal wokeness, greater freedom or bigger government. We are the last line of defense. That's a pretty powerful word. You'd be one of 435. Is Nebraska's first district really the last line of well, defense? Well, let me tell you, when you walk into the coffee shop in Columbus, Nebraska, they are almost despondent about you know, what's happening in Washington. They, they look at me and they're like, you've got to stop this. Uh, and it's, it's the one party power in Washington right now that's, that's making choices for the rest of us in America. And I do think the stakes are dire in terms of uh, we have the opportunity, I think, as Republicans to retake the House of Representatives. And I think Americans will get better government because there is that check. And look at the trillions of dollars that we're spending. Look at the record inflation that we have right now. Uh, we've got a world full of conflict. There are a lot of major issues pending, and I do think the Republicans taking over the House is uh, in the best interest of our country, and a lot of people agree with that. All right, Mike Flood, thanks for joining us today. Hey, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks Bye. for having me. Well, John Glenn Weaver also seeking the Republican nomination in May. Weaver's a retired combat veteran. Lieutenant Colonel spent 22 years in the Air Force, most recently serving as Offutt Air Force Bay at Offutt Air Force Base as Chief of the 55th Wing's Command Post. We talked with Weaver about his plans to use that experience in Congress. Well, I've had a lot of leadership opportunities and experiences in combat, which are very stressful situations. I have zero experience in politics, but I have a lot of leadership experience and I understand geopolitical events and the role of the United States Congress in sending men and women to war. Uh, very, very experienced in uh, economic issues. I have a master's in economics, so I understand uh, government inflation and things like that. Uh, but then just living a life deployed, right? Fighting the nation's wars. Uh, you don't get any more uh, experience than that. So incidentally, I studied, uh, majored in Russian, I speak Russian and I, I lived in Russia and went to Moscow State University. So I'm very familiar with Russian, the Russian language and Russian history. Um, I think from a U.S. perspective, uh, I, w I don't agree with a no-fly zone. I flew in a no-fly zone in northern and southern watch in Iraq. We got shot at regularly. I would not put our men and women in, in harm's way uh, to fight and defend Ukraine. But what I would have done uh, is sent them enablers sooner rather than later. They needed, uh, President Zelensky needed the supplies uh, enabling drones. He needed ISR a lot sooner than, than I believe the Biden administration gave it to him. And if I was a member of Congress, I would have understood that because I've been to war several times myself. And he needed those, those weapons, guns, artillery, et cetera, to fight back Russia rather than getting them sort of a day late and a dollar short. 
So the number one uh, economic issue, I think, by far, as I've traveled the district, this is my full-time job, by far the number one issue is inflation. And uh, having, being an economist myself, master's in econo economics, government allocating resources and money is, is the worst way to spend money. Governments, uh, government hand, wasteful government spending on the stimulus packages for COVID, three, maybe four packages now, I think has got us in the situation where, situation where we are. You go to Starbucks, they don't have people making coffees, there's a shortage of labor. Best thing we could do is stop uh, wasteful government spending and stimulus packages need to end yesterday. So I, I would probably grade it maybe a D. I think we overreacted like we overreacted with the Iraq war. I think the intelligence wasn't there to go to Iraq, to, to, to go to war. Uh, I think we overreacted, and I think we overreacted with COVID. I think, I think we listened to the doctors and the physicians uh, and married to a doctor myself. I think physicians, uh, their risk tolerance is that no one should die. And so we sacrificed uh, our freedoms, we sacrificed our kids' education, we sacrificed our economy, when we could have had a different approach and a strategy where it is if you're at risk, you stay home, right? So at the beginning of this, children were never gonna be affected by um, the virus, but yet we masked them up and now they can't, you know, when they talk to each other, they can't understand what they're saying because kids growing up are used to reading lips. Uh, I would not have done any mandates, no vaccination mandates. I, I, Sadly, in the military, I was forced to kick people out for not getting the vaccination, which if I'm a member of Congress, I'll go back and create legislation to allow them to come back in or certainly give them an honorable discharge. But I would not have agreed with, with any mask mandates. If you wanna wear a mask, you can wear a mask. If you feel like you're at risk, then don't go to public places. If you want the vaccination, I got the vaccination, I would recommend it. But if you don't want the vaccination, I wouldn't force, the government's job is not to force people to wear a mask or get vaccinations because where does the government overreach and control, where does it end? You know, so if a bunch of doctors say you need to do this, then we got the whole whole nation leading uh, with that way. So I, I would completely against any kind of man, especially in Nebraska. And still to come, the other side of the aisle, two names are on the Democratic ballot in May. You're gonna hear their priorities next.